on uh, the sunny afterno uh, afternoon. It's very lovely to see you all. My name is Jenny Overman. I'm with the Ethics Committee of the CFA VBA Society of the Netherlands. Um, before we dive into um, today's very interesting topic with Dr. Eoko Fiola, I have a few quick housekeeping remarks. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So you will receive the link afterwards to uh, to look back. Also, the presentation will um, will follow with that message as well. Um, if you are able to, would you kindly turn on your cameras, please, so that um, Mr. Fiole will uh, can see who he's talking to. Um, and finally, we have um, some time after the presentation um, for. Q and A. So, if you have any questions, you can uh, type them in chat, and um, we'll deal with them uh, in the second half of the presentation. Um, so then, now it is up to me to introduce Dr. Elko Fiol. Um, he is the managing partner of Alpha Governance Partners, which was founded in 2015. They provide a fiduciary services partnership with partners serving as risk governance specialists in complex investments, sustainability, blockchain and fintech across Europe, North America and Asia. Um, he is also the adjunct professor of finance ethics at the universities of Lausanne and Neuchâtel with over 25 years of experience in the finance industry. Dr. Fiola has um, 15 plus years of board COO and CFO experience in the alternative investments, wealth and blockchain space. Um, previously, he was with ABN AMRO, UBS, Credit Suisse and WPC. Um, he is um, an eternal student which hold, and holds degrees and designations in various domains, including economics, ethics and blockchain. And currently, he's studying environmental governance at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Uh, and in 2022, he is nominated for the CFA Institute Inspirational Leader Award. He volunteers in various capacities. Um, he is the chair of the Alpha Summit Advisory Group of CFA Institutes. And as he is doing for us this afternoon, he regularly speaks on governance, ethics and risk and how those topics all intersect in, in our provision. Um, so I will kindly give the floor to Dr. Fiole. Yes, I was muted. Uh, thanks so much, Jenny. And uh, welcome everybody that you take time out uh, in this afternoon, especially if you're in Europe, um, to uh, speak about or listen to a piece on ethics um it is beautiful weather i must say also here in zurich where i'm based um so i shall i promise that i will look at the screen and not too much outside um yeah the uh, the title here is is sound fiduciary decision making for investment directors supports moral philosophy investment directors here are those people on the um, uh, top end of the organization that make decisions so if i say investment directors that could be directors in fund structures uh, or of asset managers, but also you can think about uh, chief investment officers, uh, CROs, and so on. So those people who are uh, on the um, on the decision making end of uh, of, of an uh, investment organization, um, and those decisions can be pretty difficult. Uh, it, it, it hasn't, of course, escaped you that uh, current environment is is very volatile, even even more difficult than maybe before. It seems that it's only getting more complex, uh, especially if you have to manage other people's money. Now, uh, what I tend to say is that governance in the investment space is different. If you look on the left side of the slide, you see the architecture of corporate governance, which is an integrated uh, structure. Uh, you have shareholders that uh, elect a board of directors and the board of directors elects the CEO and other uh, officers of an, of, an, of an integrated corporation. And so the governance is uh, is top down. Now, an integrated com company, of course, also outsources uh, certain functions, and so you you get a little bit of a uh, a different governance requirement there. 
But if you look on the right side, here is what you see uh, is a structure of, um, of an investment fund. And an investment fund is a legal entity in itself, uh, as you see here in, uh, on the number two, investment fund product. And every function is, uh, of, of, this, of this legal entity is outsourced. You have a fund board of directors that overlooks uh, the running of the fund. And then you have all of these different parties that you know from the investment manager um, to uh, um, administrator, distributor, and so on. So you have all these functions that operate a fund uh, which are outsourced and which are being managed, let's say, through uh, contracts. And this investment fund product, i.e. this legal entity, has a board of directors uh, that is typically uh, occupied by dependent and independent non-executive directors. And the dependent directors coming, uh, for example, from the investment manager uh, and the independents are externals, uh, which normally uh, can really act independently on behalf of um, uh, investors. So you can imagine that to govern this structure is actually more complex than to govern an integrated structure. Uh, especially if you think about a trade in a fund, yeah. if, if trade goes, um, uh, you know, gets stuck somewhere uh, in the execution, then you already can ask yourself, well, okay, who has the operational risk? Uh, what is the legal framework that governs at that moment in time, at this trade, uh, depending on where the manager sits and where the administrator sits and so on and so this is uh, this is a complex uh, um, uh, structure and you have a, a number of issues here right because you can see also that this board is uh, of course being dominated by the investment manager uh, the investment manager may sit on the board the investment manager typically appoints is the first uh, party that appoints directors to uh, a fund product when it's being launched uh, and of course, the investment manager with 90, uh, 90 plus percent of, of asset management fees um, is, of course, also a major, um, yeah, major party there, a very strong party. In fact, the other uh, parties, the administrator and so on, they actually take only a few percent uh, of the total expense ratio of, uh, of a fund. And so um, this is really a complex uh, structure. As I say here, similar to other, other outsourced setups, you can think about smaller pension funds, you can think about uh, family offices uh, and so on. The more there is an outsourcing structure um, uh, and, or delegation structure, the more complex it becomes. And so if you are a director of a, of a fund, in this case, or an outsourced structure, um, that is what I tend to say, not uh, for the faint at heart. Um, the, thing, the nature of the decisions that you have to make uh, in, in a fund board, uh, but that also goes very well to, you know, is also valid for chief investment officers or other senior people that make decisions, is that you make decisions with other people's money on behalf of somebody else, on behalf of the uh, uh, investor. And so uh, there is this uh, fiduciary duty we're going to talk about to place the interest of the investment, of, sorry, of the investor first. So we, as directors or as senior investment people, we face difficult decisions, both on the process of investment management, uh, but particularly uh, on conflicts of interest. And I'm gonna speak a little bit about uh, conflicts of interest. Now, decisions, you know, we look for the technical decisions. Oftentimes we're being informed with data. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, experience that we bring to the table. But we need to recognize that decisions also can have various moral dimensions uh, and we need to understand uh, the, the, the moral intensity. And the thing is that we, um, you know, as we experience and if, as we go through a life, we get, you know, we with Aristotle would say, we, we, you know, we get experience and we get a better judgment skill. Uh, but it is important to actually be very aware of, of what it is that we are looking at. And so we need we need to think about our awareness when we make uh, decisions. Uh, so here I've listed uh, six um, uh, elements of moral intensity, uh, which you may recognize. Um, let's say social consensus, consequences, uh, temporal immediacy, uh, right? If, if you take a decision today and when the consequence actually uh, happen, uh, how far those affected are uh, away from, from your decision making, um, and so on and so forth. 
And the, the other element that I'd like to bring is the moral framing, namely, how do we frame something uh, to make it less look, uh, more, look more or less ethical? Just as an example of this, just this, actually this very morning, uh, did I have a CEO of an organization coming to me, asking my opinion on saving cost in an organization by having the accountant, uh, outsourcing the accounting and the auditing to the same firm. So the auditor would do uh, also the accounting and the other way around. And I, and I thought, okay, this is of course, uh, yes, maybe you can save cost here, but it is clear that there's a conflict of interest there. So in order to mitigate that conflict of interest, you need to do an extra function of verification, i.e. increase the cost again. Um, there's of course an ethical dimension to this kind of um, decision, i.e. to manage this kind of conflict uh, of, of interest. And it goes well until it doesn't go well anymore, right? And that is the, uh, that's the thing, the moment that there's 50 euros missing, um, then of course this conflict of interest pops up and questions can be uh, asked. So here I have listed a couple of uh, conflicts of interest, especially in the investment space. And I don't want to go through all of them, but some of them are pretty obvious. Um, so if I go through, so for example, um, if you look at number four, um, if you are an asset manager and you are part of a, a group, a universal bank maybe, where you have also wealth management and investment banking and so on, uh, then maybe uh, you may have an incentive to push other interest, uh, business interests as well. Uh, so you're an asset manager, you need a line of credit for the fund, and you're going to take the line of credit from the investment bank, um, because then at least the business is within, uh, within the group. But obviously, uh, investors would want those decisions uh, to be at arm's length uh, and have this line of credit, for example, here it's an investment decision, but basically any decision um, to be objective and um, at, at lowest cost and so on and lowest risk to, to the fund. Another obvious one would be, of course, the fees, where the investment manager wants to maximize fees. Um, uh, directors on behalf of their investors would actually say the fees have to go down. Um, and that is a, a difficult issue as well. You will hardly uh, find that being addressed. Uh, and a very big one is number eight, where investment managers, they like, of course, to increase assets on the management because the, uh, the pricing structure is such that you charge a percentage of assets. And it has very little to do with uh, the investment returns that, um, that you do or do not achieve uh, for, uh, for investors. And, uh, and so there's, there, there are conflicts of interest baked, you know, baked into the model. Um, uh, now, sometimes uh, or often we, we try with regulation to regulate these um, uh, conflicts out of the structure. Uh, but the thing is that we cannot regulate everything. We are also reliant on what people, you know, do in, in, in reality and what, what values, to use a big word, they bring, they bring to bear. So I need to click. So here's an example. It's a year and a half old from the UK. Uh, for Carillion, um, where directors are facing, in this case, regulatory action. Um, in this particular case, also the Carillion um, pension fund was uh, was involved, and uh, and so this is uh, this is a really uh, serious uh, issue for directors uh, if investors get, are being being harmed. Um, now, this is an example of a year and a half old uh, from the FT. But uh, basically, there's no lack of uh, questions being asked, uh, if I would not use the term scandal, uh, in the newspapers on, on a daily or weekly uh, basis. Uh, and so this is not about talking about Carillion per se. It is about a system in which we, uh, which we need to be aware of, let's say, and, and, and hopefully uh, do better with. So if, um, if we make you know, uh, wrong decisions, uh, if we do not manage our conflicts of interest, um, we run huge financial and reputational losses for a variety of stakeholders, right? For, for everybody, for, uh, for you individually as a decision maker, uh, for the manager, for the industry, uh, regulators, and so on. And so what we get as a result is that people do not trust the system of governance anymore. And, uh, and they may withdraw their assets. They may say, okay, I prefer to listen to the TikTok movies on crypto. 
uh, and I love crypto, so I will not, uh, you know, we could talk about it as well, uh, right? But uh, the advice uh, from, from TikTok may not be the best advice. And so the, uh, it is actually important for society that, uh, that we can trust uh, the, the system. Now, I want to backtrack a little bit and understand what is a director's uh, duty. So you're on the board of a fund or you're on the board of an asset manager, you're on the board of a pension fund, right? And uh, you have the top view over uh, the investment process and the investments. Um, now, in our jurisdiction, every jurisdiction has a definition of fiduciary duty. And sometimes this is better defined than others. So, for example, in common law systems, especially so UK, US, and so on, uh, fiduciary duty is a legal concept um, uh, and is legally, let's say, defined in continental Europe under civil law jurisdictions. We have a little bit less uh, focus on, or, or, or let's say, a meaning of a fiduciary duty, but it is still uh, part of a, the law of agency. Um, so the fiduciary duty, what it is that we need to do for our investors is, uh, is well understood. And when you get onto a board uh, or when you get into a senior position, you accept that fiduciary duty uh, knowingly or unknowingly. It is, it is oftentimes people get into positions without realizing that actually they, they, uh, their fiduciary duties is being increased. Uh, they're less of an agent and more of a fiduciary. And of course, this is based on merit because somebody qualifies for that position and you don't need to do it for free, right? You actually uh, can ask a fee because you're also a qualified professional and you need to be paid for your service, even though it's also an honorable thing, of course, to, uh, to accept. And what the word fiduciary means is that um, there are some elements which together make up, let's say, the meaning of fiduciary. First of all, one party has discretionary power over the interest of another. And that is certainly the case if you think about investors investing in a fund. Uh, most people who invest in a fund uh, would not be able to, um, to do anything else other than invest in that fund, i.e., for example, for pension savings uh, or anything else. Um, and um, the investment manager gets the discretionary power to actually do, uh, hopefully, what's right and trade in and trade out of the fund and invest. Um, in fact, the, um, the, the investment manager, uh, the fiduciary, is obligated to use that power to serve the other's best interest. You can't just say, do nothing. Uh, yesterday, I had this, this conversation with somebody um, that was, you know, with the idea of charging a management fee over the cash component of the fund. Um, and then the discussion went back and forth a bit, you know, is cash an investment strategy? And maybe it, maybe it is, right? Uh, but are you then charging uh, for that? The other problem with the investment industry is that we are so specialized that there is no way that uh, clients cannot uh, trust strangers. Uh, it is impossible for people to oversee the work of an investment manager. And as a result, clients, beneficiaries, investors are vulnerable. Uh, the easy example would be, of course, that if you have a child of 10 years old that inherits a million euro, um, obviously this child cannot uh, invest his money uh, herself. Uh, and as a result, somebody else needs to do it. And that child, of course, is very vulnerable. So it is an example, but we have this all the time uh, everywhere. And uh, you can think of, um, of, of even people who are in other professions who obviously um, are too far away to actually do anything else than trust complete strangers uh, with their money. And so this is a key element of, uh, of, the, of, of the definition of fiduciary. Uh, there is no alternative than to trust those strangers. So this is related to trust, protecting assets for those who cannot do it themselves. Now there is a good a famous statement out of the US um, that actually a trustee or a fiduciary or a director uh, somebody who's dealing with other people's money oh. is held to something stricter than the marketplace. Okay, so it is not an element of market. Let the market do its thing and uh, then it's fine. Or uh, we can put it in a contract. Uh, what to do? It is principle based. And so um, actually it is seen as the, uh, the highest standard of behavior which is required um, when you are a fiduciary. 
And obviously, uh, it serves a huge social interest because we need we need those fiduciaries, we need investment managers to build pensions for people, to build savings for people, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, to come back to the previous uh, statement about Carillion, failure is seen as a huge moral wrong. When we, we, we feel that you can't trust the system, and you can't trust these people who take decisions, uh, it is seen as a big moral wrong, even if things have been uh, legal. And we can also speak a bit about the difference between legal and, and moral, uh, maybe in the Q&A. So the question is, can ethics, can moral philosophy help? Uh, just before this uh, uh, presentation, I chatted with Jenny a bit about, you know, the word of ethics and uh, do I use the word moral philosophy? It sounds a bit uh, old fashioned um, because we don't want to scare people off. It is about the analysis. It's not about uh, the judgment. It's about the analysis. Is there material within philosophy? And there is, which can help us navigate uh, this, uh, this landscape. Um, very often ethics is seen as esoteric and I will put to you that ethics is not esoteric. Um, now, if you, if you think about finance people or legal people, uh, or, or engineers, um, as I originally was trained to be one, um, you know, we want to be precise. We now want to know for certain, we want to stick to definitions. Um, and, uh, that is what we makes us feel uh, comfortable. But the reality is, if you sit on the board, then you're faced with all kinds of issues and uh, risks come and go. They emerge, they emerge from situations, they morph into other type of risks. Um, I, even today, if you look at the world today, is it responsible uh, to manage, uh, you know, how are you going to manage equities, um, right, with the current situation? How are you going to manage um, uh, uh, bonds. I mean, are we going all everybody now in crypto? Are we all going into gold uh, and so on? It, there's, there's a huge amount of ambiguity. To what extent do our models really work? Uh, how precise can it really be? And what can you know? What is ethics uh, in this domain um, if it's not esoteric? So here I have a non-academic definition of uh, of ethics. Uh, I took it from from Wiki, but it, the thing is that it is sort of what it is. Um, ethics seeks to resolve questions uh, by looking by, by defining <coughs> concept, good and evil, right and wrong, uh, and so on. It is the it is the art and science of having the right thought uh, and and doing the right thing. And um, that is of course not an easy uh, not an easy definition. Um, making decisions for others uh, is of course in, uh, with the fiduciary duty. Uh, is of course the domain of uh, of, of ethics um, because you need to do make to make the right decision, right? Um, or uh, you know the the best decision um, under the circumstances. And there are different uh, decisions possible. Typically, uh, you know, good, better, best, and so on. So what is what is the right thing to do? And it is different, by the way, than what you now get. Um, what people a lot of people talk about uh, in uh, psychology. Right way, we talk about behavioral psychology or behavioral finance, I should say, the influence of psychology in finance, uh, where we take out biases. That is all important, uh, of course, uh, and very useful work, uh, but it doesn't uh, provide any direction. And maybe we can talk a bit about that as well. So I want to present to you three schools of thought of moral philosophy, which may help us in, in making our uh, decisions and help us navigate. Now, the reality is that there is no, in, in ethics, we recognize that there is no one school of thought, or in reality, I should say, which always leads to the right answers. So the idea that as an economist, uh, or as a finance quant, or as a, as, a, as, a, as a lawyer, you come to a definition and that you stick to it, uh, we don't have this in ethics. Uh, there are you know, different circumstances and we can apply different models. And what I'm trying to achieve with presenting these models is giving some uh, some thoughts about how we can look at things and once we recognize this um, let's say from ourselves but also the situation that we find ourselves in it is easier to check our intentions and and, and make better decisions and navigate risks so the first school of thought is uh, deontology and it is something else than dentistry uh, it is a this is a kind of a funky word 
uh, deontology, uh, if you could say that you are a deontologist, and in fact, the chief ethics officer of the Banque de France, the French National Bank, his French job title is uh, deontologist, actually, which, is, uh, which was interesting. Uh, the unit of analysis are actions by people. So uh, in deontology, it is not about the people themselves, but it is what they do. Um, and basically what Immanuel Kant says is that you have to look at actions as they follow from rules of conduct. And he calls these laws. These are not legal laws, right? These are laws as almost like natural laws, what you would get in, uh, in physics. Um, so we have rules of conduct which result into uh, an action. Now we're going to skip um, uh, two, that's a bit, a bit deeper. But if you look at three, which is absolutely key here, the action that you take is um, you should think about it as you what you want to achieve with this action is that this action becomes by your will a universal law of nature and that is what we call reasonable so i give you an example um, if you lie right for good reason um, because you don't want to worry somebody um, then you can you can have to ask yourself now that i'm lying is this something that I would like to be a universal law? Is this something that uh, everybody should be doing and that I should always be doing? And likely the answer is no, right? So, um, uh, so we have to think about our action. Is it something that, um, and that's aspirational that can be a universal law of nature? And, uh, and, and oftentimes we come to the conclusion, this is not the case, but that should, that would be reasonable, right? If we say actually lying, we shouldn't lie. Um, it focuses on intent, which is important because we like to think about talk, talking about uh, results and being results focused. Uh, but the reality is you have to ask yourself, well, what is my intent in order to get to this result? And uh, what you see is that if we do not understand enough what our intent is, what our intention is, then maybe we get results in an unethical way, or maybe we get different results than we actually wanted to achieve. And so uh, to the extent that we are results focused, we also need to couple that to, uh, to intent. And, uh, and, and, and that is important as well to, to, uh, to stray not in unethical um, uh, territory. We've all heard maybe of the categorical imperative, uh, that imperative, that instruction, which is absolute and unconditional, that is an imperative, that is, um, uh, mandatory, let's say, for everybody. So, for example, don't lie uh, is a categorical imperative. As I say, this is an ultra brief introduction. Now, an action has moral worth if the universal law applies, right? Where you say, okay, this is valid for everybody. But the moment that you start making exception on exception, you deviate more and more from universal law. And that is something that we, we can apply, of course, uh, for all kinds of good reasons, but at least we need to be aware of it. Um, Kant then speaks about uh, humans, people, I have, you know, they, have, they, are, they are beings of experience, they have desires, they're happiness seeking, and, and he has defined how happiness looks like. And happiness is a bit different if you go from school to school. Um, in deontology, it is to be worthy of happiness. So you do something which is so good that other people um, uh, that you deal with uh, give you credit for it and you feel happy. So that is sort of the simply said um, uh, way of looking at it. Um, but acting in accordance with reason and reasonable is what is universal law. Now, if you look at society, then, then you come to the conclusion that each person is ruler and ruled. We all set rules. We all create laws by doing things, but we're also ruled by others. So I can decide on how I invest for my uh, client as a fund manager. But at the moment that I get into a taxi, the taxi driver decides how to take the route to bring me from A to B, right? So in society, we are ruler and ruled. Okay, so um, in that sense, we don't, you know, the rational freedom is basically uh, that we are free to the extent it fits in a society, right? So we have to subjugate uh, to the extent yeah. that we want to be uh, free. So there is no, no slavery, for example. Okay, this was super short. There's a lot more to say about it. Second school I like to put to you is utilitarianism. It takes time to actually learn this word. It took me also some time. <laughs> and here, the idea is that you're looking for, I'm not reading it to you, but you're looking for actions 
um, that yields the most benefit to the largest uh, uh, group of people. Um, okay, so it is about, uh, it says here, pleasure over pain, accumulated for all humanity. It, so it's not about the individual. If I need to kill one person to save 99 other people, I need to do it, according to utilitarianism. If I kill one person to save 99 other people, according to deontology, I should not do it, because killing somebody else could not be a universal law. So you already see how these schools are different, right? Um, okay, here we see uh, morality requires everyone to be equal. Uh, it's all about sentient creatures, so actually he does include also animals, for example, uh, and we need firm principles uh, and governance, uh, let's say, to be, to be moral. Uh, and he says, it's say here, of humanity, right? So of the system as a whole. And, and we'll come to an example of that uh, in a moment. So pleasure over pain, uh, difficult to measure. Uh, different um, uh, commentators have looked into it. And I like uh, particularly the last piece of this first paragraph. Maybe we just ask people, what does pain mean to you? What does pleasure mean to you, right? And hopefully uh, the mathematicians here in the audience, you can think about them sort of an I'm not going to say an Excel sheet, that would be an offense, of course, to mathematicians, but you can think about how you would uh, summarize this. Um, okay, an example of utilitarianism is, uh, is taxation, right? Where uh, we all pay taxes so that the community uh, benefits from, uh, from taxes. And uh, you can ask if this is justice, uh, you know, taxation, you steal or you steal, you take from the individual, uh, and you give it to, to others, right? So here, taxation, uh, wealth redistribution, these kind of things are a classic example of a utilitarianist approach um, that you would not do under a deontology, right? So here, the focus is the, is the group of people, the community, uh, maximizing pleasure over pain uh, for, for groups. And that's a different way of thinking. So now I've presented already two different ways of thinking and hopefully it creates some uh, awareness. Now, the third school I'd like to introduce is virtue ethics, which is a bit older. And Aristotle has basically um, uh, realized that uh, the world is a messy place. The world is complicated, it's ambiguous. So forget about finding precise answers. Anything that we find as answers are tentative, imprecise, um, valid only for a certain amount of time and then no longer valid. Um, and uh, it's, it's a bit messy. So how do we engage with this variety uh, that we see uh, in life? And Aristotle says, well, it requires practical wisdom. And practical wisdom is the summation of judgment and experience, thinking and acting. Okay, so you, we need to, as we, uh, as we grow up, we are gaining experience and hopefully also we develop our judgment skills. So, uh, you know, if, if you if, if you have a boss, uh, which is literally 20 years your junior, um, then obviously you're suffering because this person has less experience uh, and maybe also less developed judgment skills. And so we are suffering as a result. Uh, and hopefully, uh, not always the case, of course, uh, Jenny and I were just talking about how sometimes leadership fails us. I very experienced people that do not have um, the leadership experience that we actually need. Um, so hopefully, you know, um, that's not the case, but you need uh, a development in judgment experience to actually develop practical wisdom, which you then apply to a situation at hand. And um, the concern here is with what sort of people we should be, what character we should try to develop. Uh, what kind of character traits, right? Are we courageous? Are we cowards? Uh, and so on. And those character traits are virtues. So we should develop uh, virtues to be able to deal with difficult situations. The function of a human being is flourishing, in, according to Aristotle, is similar to um, uh, what, is the, what is the function of a plant, right? A plant is grows up and produces flowers. And if we see that, then we say, oh, there is uh, there's flourishing there. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is for people, what is their flourishing function? And we can all ask ourselves that, right? What is it that makes us flourish? And that is what we need to then uh, achieve. So the, you know, the, the, the more virtue that we have, the more we, we flourish. Um, and so there's, there's text uh, around that there as well. 
Um, so the more excellent that we are, the more virtuous that we are, uh, the happier, the more we flourish and so on. Um, practical wisdom is then is that we possess the virtue. So we have developed that uh, these judgment skills, we have developed those uh, to understand what is important, what is less important. And actually, we also act on those perceptions. Uh, so we do the right thing as well. And this is practical wisdom. And that would be the morally admirable person. So it's a different model of thinking again, right? We had the ontology, which basically looks at acts. And you've got uh, acts which are positive and negative, and maybe also neutral acts. Um, in Euthanism, we had to think of, well, you know, pleasure over pain for the community, for a community or the human community. Uh, and in virtue ethics, we look at development of virtues and apply it to the concrete situation. And the reality is that we are never uh, always one, right? We always have elements of all. So the, the conclusion that I want to draw from, uh, from these three schools of thought is that actually there are thinking systems out there, right? Which can help make sense of, of problems. So the moment we are faced with a problem or a difficult decision, especially in the light of fiduciary duty, i.e. dealing with other people's money in, you know, in, in, a, in a complex, uh, complex world, there are some models which help us uh, navigate uh, difficult situations. I put here a link that you will see in the deck when you get it, uh, where you can test what you're yourself. It's interesting. This is only a test for two schools, Euthotarianism and Deontology. Um, uh, but if you do these tests that you will find online, you find that, uh, you know, you may be 70% uh, the Euthotarianist and 30% and the Deontologist. You may be 40% uh, virtue ethicist uh, and 40% the ontologist and 20% utilitarianist. It would be interesting to test yourself. Where are you uh, as, a, as, a, as a person? And how does it change over time, maybe? Right? Because um, our, our, our socialization and, and, and circumstances change us as well. So I come to the conclusion, and I hope you would agree, that uh, ethics can support decision making because we, you know, we can be aware of what model that we are currently, you know, faced with or that we are moving ourselves in. And the moment that, as I said, for example, the, uh, the example of results focused, that we are saying, oh, we're very results focused. Uh, I, uh, I look for results, right? Then we, have to, then we have to know, ah, let me check my intention here because maybe otherwise I go off course. So. If I take those three schools of thought and I come uh, to a conclusion here, um, the ontology tells us that we can um, um, establish rules of conduct. And that also explains, by the way, the uh, job title of the chief ethics officer of Banque de France in French, uh, which is the ontologist, because he sets rules of conduct for the staff of the Banque de France. OK, and it's not for the French financial industry, but for the central bank. We need to check our intention and we need to see if we can categorize this as categorical or if it's just an exception or an exception or an exception, right? Because then we've landed to a gray zone. We also need to check if a decision can be seen as universal law or if it's, again, exception or not. Utilitarianism teaches us that we can have principles of governance, people are equal, and that happiness uh, can be uh, uh, assessed as a of stakeholders, uh, which is, of course, a wider um, audience than just uh, uh, people, investors, and so on. Virtue ethics te teaches us that virtues are important and that we can train them uh, and that they are impacted by relationships because sometimes maybe we're not so virtuous because uh, we want to make money or I want to secure a job or whatever it is, right? It's, uh, we have to look at our incentive systems as well. What does our incentive system uh, cause us to be, right? Uh, to what extent our virtues being uh, developed there or also being encouraged there. Okay, so already from the legal definition of fiduciary duty, we know that care, prudence, loyalty, and so on is, is required, but that is based on jurisprudence, especially in common law systems, as I mentioned, uh, even though also here in, con in continental Europe, we, we, we know these kind of concepts as well. So we already see that virtues are uh, being explained being used. So this is one of the two killer slides of this uh, of this deck. Um, and I would phrase the sentence like this. So 
in a um, investment setting. I, I showed you the corporate governance, integrated uh, governance architecture, and also the fund governance. Uh, and by the way, we can also talk about uh, tokenization and so on in crypto, which have uh, similarities there. We need to set governance principles and we need to be willing to act on those principles. So this is, you recognize this as a utilitarianist approach. Then uh, cherish developing virtues by gaining experience. That is uh, Aristoteles. Now we are faced with a decision, recognize the moral content and intensity, the list that I gave you. Uh, so that's also a killer slide, of course. Uh, number five, check your intention, understand the importance of framing. In my case this morning, when I had this, this question around accounting and audit, of the same done by the same uh, firm recognize fiduciary duty versus the investors stick to try to stick to universal law and then you make a decision and if you do this then aspirationally you make a fiduciary what i call sound decision you make a better decision than if you just do it from the gut uh, or um, um, yeah based on whatever experiences that we had okay so this is the checklist um, and just to give you an example of a decision that I recently was, uh, was made aware of that I, somebody spoke to me about, uh, how he participated in an investment committee where, um, uh, the decision was discussed, should we, or should we not, uh, de uh, uh, at that time, not uh, still, um, you know, withdraw from Russia, uh, take our investments out of Russia and uh, reallocate it somewhere. And then there was a discussion, of course, and what you get. There's a number of people around the table that, you know, sort of willing by the gut. Um, and, uh, you look around the table, some opinions and so on. And then some, you know, some kind of opinion comes out of it. Now, opinions and especially the feeling of moral outrage, let's say, is a good starting point to understand and make, become aware of where you are, uh, ethically speaking. But obviously, the discussion in this case about uh, uh, Russia, uh, then expanded because then people say, well, if we would divest from Russia, should you not also divest maybe from other areas in the world where we are currently invested, which also have uh, all kinds of uh, problems? Should we only invest then in liberal democracies? Are we are we saying that this is a pension fund, right? Uh, which actually invests on behalf of uh, beneficiaries. So it's you can imagine that if you go through a checklist that you become more aware of the issues, you land uh, maybe at a better uh, decision than you would have made otherwise. Um, and, uh, and at least you can also show it to your investors. This was the thought process that we went through. So let me stop there. Uh, hopefully I didn't beat you down with all of this stuff so fast. Uh, and uh, we can move into uh, a Q&A uh, conversation. Yeah, it doesn't, it's not needed. Let's see. Yeah. Jenny, back to you. Yes, thank you very much, Yoko. This was... Uh... Fascinating and um, very practical as well, which is, I think, a challenge with uh, these kinds of discussions and ethics education. Um, and I think that's uh, also what shaped uh, my first question as part of the uh, the ethics committee. Of course, our mission is to um, uh, to broaden ethics education for uh, for all Dutch members of the of the society and how we can do that best and you already mentioned that ethics sounds scary sometimes to people in in our profession especially um so how would you go about bringing this topic more to the forefront in uh in an industry that's uh, might not be that responsive to it yeah yeah, this is a problem um, which we can tackle. So, like many of you, uh, I, I worked in my, my whole life in the investment industry and I started to get an interest in ethics uh, years ago, um, partly also uh, by, by my own CFA studies in those, in those days. And um, the question is, you know, what is the right, what is the right thing to do? Uh, and if one speaks about ethics with, with people in the investment space, um, there's a couple of issues. Number one, uh, finance people are typically not trained in ethics in those kind of models that I just presented. And there, of course, there's a lot more uh, out there which has been uh, written about, which we can apply uh, in a daily life. As I mentioned, it's not esoteric at all. Um, so finance people, uh, economists uh, and so on, we are not trained 
uh, in this domain. Uh, we are trained to look at uh, cost benefit analysis, uh, allocation of scarce resources, uh, risk return ideas, and so on. Um, and so uh, we need this training. Now, the flip side is that typically uh, ethicists or philosophers, they would not necessarily have a clue how a hedge fund runs, how a line of credit works, uh, how credit cards work, and so on. So the idea that we apply financial services to, you know, to, to a, or, or provide that to a philosopher um, is, is actually very tricky there as well, because then, you know, how do you, how do you match that? And uh, I made, uh, you know, quite some investment of my personal time in this field. And so I've, I've brought some topics together, but it is actually, um, uh, it's not that, it's not that, uh, not that common, uh, but there is material. So that is one thing. The second thing what we can do is training, right? The second thing what we need to do is take out the angle of, um, of judgment in the sense that um, uh, I will, you know, if I speak about ethics, I focus on the analysis, as you've seen, I took look at the, the models, how can we apply it? So it is not, I don't want to put a slide up which says one firm is terrible or one person is terrible or you are terrible or I are ter is terrible, you know, I am terrible. That is not the idea. It is not about judgment. It's about making better decisions, uh, having an interest in, in better decisions and staying away from, from uh, what I call ethical risk, which express themselves in reputational risks and also financial risks. And so um, this idea of, you know, ethics should be a normal to uh, topic to talk about without immediately this negative, uh, this negative weight that uh, draws it down. And as a result, um, the, the, it is important in that aspect also to separate our personal ethics uh, from what I call analytical ethics. So uh, personal ethics, what I find personally important because the moment that I would say this and this is important to me and you will have to go, oh, this and this is important to me, we have an argument and it becomes personal very, very quickly. And you can't make a good uh, decision based on that. So it is much better in my mind to, to go through the motions of going through these kind of what I call the killer slides or, and some of the other notions of ethics to actually understand where do we, where are we moving on this, on this scale and what is important here instead of uh, just let's say your opinion versus my opinion and the other way around. So we need to take that, uh, that, that element of, uh, of negative judgment, if you will, uh, out of it and just be aspirational and say, you know what, uh, we, we, we are being bombarded with ethical questions all around. Uh, and so it makes sense to, uh, to look into it instead of uh, uh, accusations uh, and so on. That, that doesn't help anybody. Right. Then I'm curious if uh, there are any other questions. If anyone has any questions for Elko for now? Oh, yeah, otherwise if I, I may. Can... Yes, of course. Let me just lower my hand first. Uh, thank you, Elko, for the very inspiring and insightful uh, presentation. Um, I actually watched a, a Netflix show that uh, briefly touched upon these different types of schools in a more uh, humorous way, but it's it's nice to see the more serious part uh, of it. Um, my question is actually related to um, your your view with regards to ethics with, on an organization level versus the ethics that all the individual employees have within uh, that same organization. Uh, do you believe that the, like the company ethics can be leading there or whether it's always just the sum of all the different people's um, sets of morals and, and values etc so uh, in short my question is really about um, can the business ethics or the, the company ethics actually um, influence the individuals or is yeah. it always bottom up yeah so first i'm happy that you're looking uh, at this on netflix as well because this is of course a fantastic medium to to get people interested in the topic um i would be interested by the way in which show that was because i also look at netflix and when i work out um, it's called the, the good place okay very good thank you now the um um so the organization's ethics first of all um you know, you walk into a company and it has five values on the wall, right? For us, it's important to have integrity and to be uh, honest and, and so on. 
and um, and these topics are never operationalized uh, unfortunately most of the time there may be a code of ethics now the the the, the thing is that those uh, those 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 terms are actually put forward by individuals and so uh, I don't necessarily believe in per se organizational ethics as in ethics of an organization but basically they are the ethics of those people who influence or have power in that organization and so uh, there needs to be a, a conversation on, uh, on on at least on senior level but hopefully also more inclusive um, what it is that uh, that are ethical values which are important for the organization and then also um, they need to lead by example uh, people need to lead by example with of course the caveat that we all make mistakes we're all flawed we have you know we have dependencies and so on and so forth so perfection is not what we're going to achieve but as much as possible we need to lead by example on all levels so that needs to be uh, implemented throughout an organization and so if I'm a junior trader and I sit uh, on a trading desk and my neighbor next to me um, says, hey, listen, I just got a fantastic tip. Uh, this afternoon is going to be a merger announcement. So the stock is going to go up. We should buy it now. Then I should be free to say to my colleague, you know what? We don't, you know, we don't uh, deal on inside information, right? It's not, it's not who we are. It's not. And that is the thing with, with, the, with the ethics that we say, you know what? It's, uh, it's on all levels. Uh, we implement this we even can implement this in things like incentive systems uh, and, and build a culture uh, that certain behavior is uh, is allowed or certain behavior is also wanted so this will be the kind of the deontology uh, approach to uh, to things right so what is it that we want to see what is the behavior that we reward and what is the behavior that we don't want to see and the behavior that we punish uh, because it is clear that if somebody trades an inside information uh, as a rule uh, or hides trades, if you've seen with the SoftGen case, with the case with KVL or with uh, Barings Bank at the time, for those of you who are, now you know my age sort of, um, that, uh, you know, that this is normal behavior, then obviously uh, it's not going to work out with uh, being an ethical organization as well. Now, I will say this, if you look at conflicts of interest, uh, conflicts of interest are very often organizational. Uh, and not necessarily uh, personal. If I am working in asset management, I wouldn't particularly care myself, unless I get a bonus for it, that the line of credit for the fund that I run comes from the investment bank. But the organization, of course, they have an, actually an, uh, an interest of making money on both sides, on both the asset management side and on the, also on the investment banking side. And so um, there is a, you know, conflicts of interest can be categorized in, in in various ways in one way would be organizational versus personal uh, and very often uh, even though i do not have an individual conflict of interest i may contribute to uh, to an organizational conflict of interest which then becomes a problem because then all of a sudden you know all these people that have worked together uh, on things they cannot be held accountable for what organizationally goes wrong right uh, and uh, and certainly not in a legal sense so who's going to jail that is a different ball game altogether again and so the uh, the buck stops somewhere, but it doesn't stop typically, although there is a well-known case in the Netherlands right now um, uh, with, you know, where somebody says, OK, I'm, I'm the CEO of the firm, therefore the buck has to stop with me, uh, even though I was not part of the all the individual elements uh, that led up to this conflict of interest and actually the exploitation of that conflict of interest. Does that answer a little bit? Yes, definitely. Very recognizable. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? Maybe I'm not, scrolling. or maybe uh, maybe they'll come up later, and then uh, for sure, sure. Uh, very much invited to uh, to contact me and. Um, We'll, uh, we'll get your questions answered as well. Um, but I think for now, and looking uh, looking at the time, uh, I very much like to thank Dr. Fiola for, for being here and for, uh, for this very interesting presentation. Um, and uh, to thank all of you for, uh, for hanging on for an hour, even though uh, the beautiful weather is already uh, 
is smiling at us. <laughs> we have a little bit still uh, still to go in the day. Um, and of course, um, a lot to to take with us in uh, in our daily work from from this presentation. Um, you'll, uh, as I mentioned, you'll receive um, an email later on from uh, from the society with the link to the recording as well as uh, as the presentation. Um, and then uh, this leaves me to uh, thank you all for being here, and I hope to uh, see you again in one uh, one of our other events.